Ladies and gentlemen, a hearty welcome to the celebration of the 160th birth anniversary of Swami Vivekananda and 130th anniversary of Swami Vivekananda's visit to Japan. Our hearty welcome also to the distinguished speakers of today's celebration. His Excellency, <coughs> Mr. C.B. George, <coughs> Professor Kathy Matsui, Professor Takahiro Kato, Mr. Leonardo Alvarez, and Sister Joke Sato. This event has been organized jointly by the Embassy of India in Tokyo, Japan, and the Vedanto Society of Japan, the only branch of the Ramakrishna Mission of India in Japan. The theme of this year's program is Swami Vivekananda's concept of yogas. ご来場の皆様、スワミ・ヴィベーカーナンダ第160回生誕記念祝賀会及びスワミ・ヴィベーカーナンダ第130回来日記念行事にようこそお越しくださいました。また、ご来賓の皆様、シビジョージ中日イン
Swami Medhasananda will lead a special prayer. You are requested to kindly stand up and repeat the prayer. It will be followed by a silent prayer, silent prayer for a few minutes. 続きまして、スワミメダサナンダジの先導で皆様に祈りをご唱和いただきます。え皆様にご起立いただき、全員で祈りの言葉を唱え、最後に数分間黙想します。So I shall chant part by part, Skoshi Skoshi, what is Tonayamas Karamina, and Kurika is the good thing. Om Asatoma Sadagamaya Tamasoma. Jyotir Kamaya, Mritturma, Omritam Kamaya, Rudra, Yatte, Dakshinam Mukham, Tenamam, Pahinityam, O oh God, please lead us from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness to the light. Lead us from death to immortality. O oh God, protect us with your benign face. Then again, Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashantu Ma Kaschit Dukkabhak Bhavet Let everyone be happy. Let everyone be healthy. Let everyone see the good. Let none suffer. Om Shanti 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 Hari Hi Om Tat Sat Dodo Om Shanti 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 Hari Hi Om Tat Sat Now please take your seat and you shall be praying silently for some time. Please close your eyes and please pray for the well being. A past and the whole humanity.
ओम शांति 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 हरि ओ ありがとうございました Thank you. Now, a book by Swami Vivekananda will be offered by His Excellency Mr. C. V. George, Ambassador of India to Japan. 次に、スワミ・ヴィベーカー・ナンダへの花束奉納の儀式です。花束をご奉納いただきますのは、中日インド大使、シビ・ジョージ閣下です。Thank you very much, Your Excellency. George 大使ありがとうございました。Next in the program is the release of the special issue of the Universal Gospel, a bi-monthly magazine of the Vedanta Society of Japan by the Ambassador, His Excellency, Mr. C.B. George. 続きまして、日本ベーダンタ協会の格月刊行誌、不滅の言葉の特別号を、ジョージ大使にご披露いただきます。Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Now we request His Excellency to deliver his address. George 大使ありがとうございました。では、シビジョージ中日インド大使にスピーチをいただきます。A very good afternoon to all of you. Swami Medha Sananda, President of Vedanta Society of Japan, distinguished speakers and guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a pleasure to see you all gathered here to celebrate the life of India's youth icon, Swami Vivekananda, today. I congratulate the Vedanta Society of Japan for collaborating with the Embassy for organizing this important event. I welcome you all to today's event. We commemorate the life of Swami Vivekananda. Not just an individual, but a phenomenon who cannot be described in just mere words. Swami Vivekananda was a colossal figure in our nation's history who played a leading role in bringing about a new awakening in India. I recall how he inspired my generation when, as school children, we used to recite his powerful words Arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. Swami Vivekananda emphasized on the ideals of service and renunciation. His belief in Yuva Shakti was unwavering, which found expression in his iconic saving, saying, Give me hundred believing youth and I shall transform India. Belief here means belief in oneself. <coughs> Dear friends, I recall the words of Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji who said, and I quote, Our freedom fighters were influenced by Swami Vivekananda. His works have always been effective in instilling nationalism in the youth. Time passed. The country became independent. But we still see Swamiji's influence today. What he said about spirituality, nationalism, and nation building, his thoughts about Jan Seva and Jag Seva flow within us with the same intensity. Unquote. Dear friends, As a young student and later as a diplomat, I was fortunate to visit many places associated with the life of Swamiji. The Vivekananda Memorial in Kanyakumari, the southernmost part of the Indian Peninsula, where the Arabian Sea, Indian Ocean, and the Bay of Bengal meet, 
where Swamiji is believed to have attained his enlightenment, his ancestral home in Kolkata, the site in Chicago where he delivered the historic 1893 address, which is still hailed as the most memorable speech that introduced India's civilization ethos, our mantra of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, to the Western world. Today, this message is being spread across the world when we adopted Vasudeva Kutumbakam, or One Earth, One Family, One Future, as the central theme of our G20 presidency. Swamiji's message has spread all across the globe. I recall one of the first places in Switzerland that I visited as India's ambassador was Sasfi to pay homage to Swami Vivekananda, who traveled to that beautiful town in the Alps Mountain in 1896, where a memorial and a statue of Swamiji stand. One felt so happy to see how Indians and foreigners visit Satsvi in large numbers to pay homage to him. And today, when we assemble here to celebrate Swamiji's life, I recall his visit to Japan in 1893 on his way to Chicago. He reportedly said that the key to Japan's greatness is the faith of the Japanese in themselves and their love for their country." Unquote. You would recall that Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi had referred to the words of Swami Vivekananda in his address to the Indian community in Tokyo in 2022. Dear friends, Swamiji's teachings will continue to influence the lives of every Indian, whether in India or abroad. I recall the unveiling of the portrait of Swamiji here earlier this year, which will serve as a reminder to us and also to all visitors to our mission on the contributions of Swamiji, who energized the young people, made them aware and unleashed their creative energies. It will continue to be a reminder for us all on the Indianness that Swamiji embodied, which continues to guide and inspire us and continue to inspire millions of young brothers and sisters. Let me conclude by quoting again Honorable Prime Minister's words. It was Swamiji who said that fearless, bold, clean-hearted, courageous and aspirational youth is the foundation on which the future of the nation is built. He always believed on youth and youth power." Unquote. I once again thank the Vedanta Society of Japan for collaborating with the Embassy of India in Tokyo for organizing this event today. I thank you all for joining us today in this important event. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your kind address. Now we will have our keynote address by Professor Takahiro Kato. Professor Kato is an associate professor, Graduate School of Humanities and Sociology, Department of Indian Philosophy and Buddhist Studies in the University of Tokyo. He is also the director of the University of Tokyo India office. He spent about two years as a research student in the center of advanced study in Sanskrit, University of Pune. May we now request Professor Kato to deliver his keynote address on Swami Vivekananda's concept of Jnana Yoga. So インド哲学仏教学研究室加藤隆弘准教授に基調講演をいただきます。東京大学インド事務所の所長も務めていらっしゃる加藤先生はインドプネ大学サンスクリット学高等研究所で研究所研究生として2年間学ばれたご経歴
His Excellency, Mr. C.B. George, and also uh, Mera Sananda Subamiji uh, for including uh, me to this event. Thank you very much. So uh, I belong to the, yeah, for, uh, thank you very much for my kind introduction about myself. I am uh, belonging to University of Tokyo uh, Department of Indian Philosophy and Buddhist Studies. And uh, my uh, uh, research area is about uh, Vedanta philosophy. I work on uh, more than 20 years. And uh, in Japan, uh, Buddhism is of course uh, widely uh, studied uh, for more than 1,000 years in Japan. But uh, Indian philosophy, study of Indian philosophy, is about 120 or 30 years, which was originally imported as a, uh, from the West, Western uh, University or Western culture. So uh, at the University of Tokyo, so the Department of Indian Philosophy and Buddhist Study was established about 120 years or so. So which is about uh, the same age uh, which uh, Vivekananda visited uh, Japan. So today I received a request from uh, Meda Sananda Swamiji to give a talk about uh, Jnana Yoga of Swami Vivekananda. And uh, to tell the truth, I'm not a specialist of Vivekananda. So yeah, I just hesitated to accept his request. But yeah, as I told you, uh, my, uh, uh, area of specialization is Vedanta philosophy, and uh, Swami Vivekananda's thought is somewhat related to uh, uh, Vedanta philosophy. So today I am going to talk about Jnana Yoga, which is, yeah, from the aspect that is related to my uh, specialization. So please uh, put up with some 15 minutes. Yeah, I will start. So Jnana Yoga is a title title of the book that comprised uh, Swami Vivekananda's lectures during the time in England. This collection is part of a uh, series that include Jnana Yoga, and Kalma Yoga, and Raja Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga. And here is a collection of Swami Vivekananda's lectures gathered uh, under the title Jnana Yoga. The content primarily focused on the philosophy of Vedanta, especially Advaita Vedanta, which is uh, deeply rooted in the uh, lineage of Shankaracharya, maybe uh, you may know well. We will come back to uh, discussing Swami Vivekananda's, uh, uh, Vivekananda's later. So for now, let's take a look at uh, Jnana Yoga itself. First, I would like to discuss Vedanta. Uh, Vedanta, in, in a narrow sense, uh, refers to the scholarly field that systematically deals with the metaphysical discussion presented in the Upanishad, uh, the text known as the Veda Anta, or the culmination of the Veda. It is based on the tradition of the fundamental scripture called the Brahma Sutra, which interprets the Upanishads. The central thema revolves around the concept of Brahman. The absolute reality uh, appears in the Upanishad, which is considered the sole principle of existence. Vedanta explores this monistic philosophy, taking Brahman as a subject of inquiry. As Vedanta uh, evolved into a significant field, it began to emphasize, yeah, the next maybe. So it began to emphasize the set of three fundamental texts, which is called Prasthana Traya. Uh, which is uh, in their academic pursuits. These three texts, uh, which from the basis of their scholarship, includes Upanishad, uh, Brahma Sutra, and Bhagavad Gita. Uh, in later Advaita Vedanta tradition, doctrines and commentaries were developed by annotating these th three fundamental texts. Prominent figures like Shankaracharya have provided commentary, commentaries, Bhashya, and explanation, Vartika, etc., on these fundamental texts. Now we take a look, closer look at uh, Jnana Yoga itself. A well known instance where the term Jnana Yoga appears is in the Bhagavad Gita. 
Here I will provide a quote from chapter 3, verse 3 of the Gita, where the term Dhyana Yoga uh, is mentioned. Loke asmin duvivida nishta pula purokta mayanaka Dhyana Yogi nam sankhya nam karma yogi na yogi nam. I skip the translation. In the Gita, the term Jnana Yoga appears in one more instance. It is found in Gita chapter 16.1. Here, here is a quote. Abayam sattva sanshuttir Jnana Yoga bevastiti dhanam damascha yagnyascha svabdhya yastapa aljadam. So it continues as follows. Babanti sampadam daivim abhijatasya bharata. So uh, these are the uh, quality of the, uh, the people who, uh, who is born to the, belong to the uh, divinity of uh, divine destiny, we can say. As stated in 3.3 of the Gita, the present uh, perspective of Jnana Yoga and Kalma Yoga are presented. Traditionally, uh, they are joined by another perspective called Bhakti Yoga. These three uh, perspectives gradually became known Jnana Marga, a path of knowledge, Kalma Marga, a path of reaction, and Bhakti Marga, the path of devotion. They are presented as three means to achieve liberation, moksha. These three paths, as presented in the Gita, provide possibility of salvation to a broader range of individuals with different societal backgrounds. By adopting the appropriate means that corresponds to their own inclinations. All people can be saved and reached to the same goal, moksha. Now the concept of jnana yoga appears in the Gita, uh, but it is, its interpretation can be a bit challenging. When we look up the word jnana yoga in the dictionaries, for example, Monier Williams Sanskrit English Dictionary describes it as a yoga as based on the acquisition of true knowledge, while Bedring Sanskrit German Dictionary explains it as a their theoretical yoga, the theoretical yoga, both referencing to uh, Gita 3.3. This suggests that the underlying philosophy of Jnana Yoga uh, existed prior to Gita, of course, but as far as we know, the term Jnana Yoga first appears in the Gita, which can be considered the oldest source at present. So scholars like us uh, turn to Bashya literature commentary uh, for help. As I mentioned earlier, the Gita is one of the most important scriptures, particularly within the scholarly tradition known as Vedanta. Consequently, numerous commentaries have been written on the Gita. So now let's, let's take a look at the commentary, Bhashya by Shankaracharya, which is among the oldest and most widely referred uh, commentaries on the Gita. Here's an explanation from uh, Shankaracharya's commentary on Gita 3.3. Through Jnana Yoga, the knowledge itself being the yoga. So Shankaracharya contemplates the relationship between Jnana and Yoga in this passage. Uh, on the other hand, in the slightly different explanation found in the Gita 16.1, another perspective is offered. I quote, the steadfastness in these, those two, namely, jnana and yoga. Previously in 3.3 of the Gita, an explanation was given in the form of knowledge equals yoga. However, uh, here in the context of 16.1, the explanation is presented in the form knowledge and yoga. This dual interpretation of the relationship between knowledge and yoga is somewhat confusing. So therefore, we need to investigate Shankaracharya's commentary a bit further. The commentary continues as follows. Jnana is understanding of the meaning of the words like Atman learned from scripture and teachers. Yoga is making those land objects intelligible only to oneself, one's own experience, through concentrating by means of withholding our sense faculties, etc. So when you closely look at uh, this commentary, you come to understand that knowledge, jnana, refers to what is learned from scripture teachers. And yoga is a process of making that acquired knowledge one's own. This provides some understanding of Jnana Yoga. 
So now let us uh, go to the a uh, little deeper and consider what exactly Ghana means. So uh, this is a, a bus memorial tower uh, located in Karadi, uh, in, in the state of Kela, at the bus place of Shankaracharya. At the entrance of the tower, so this is a tower, and at the entrance of the tower, you are uh, greeted by Shankaracharya's statue. Uh, uh, if you look at the inscription, you will see the word, Gyanat Eva Kaivalyam. Sorry, Gyanat Eva Tu Kaivalyam which translates liberation through knowledge alone. Uh, this is central teaching of Shankaracharya. While the Gita present, presents three paths to moksha, the path of knowledge, and path of action, and path of devotion, Shankaracharya says that the liberation can be attained solely through path of knowledge. The term jnana mentioned here can be understood to refer the same concept of knowledge as found in Gita. So Shankara Acharya's explanation was as follows. Knowledge is the understanding of the meaning of the world, like Atman, learned from the scripture and teachers. Then uh, what is scripture here? The passage listed here are important statements from the Upanishads uh, scripture, known as Mahavakyas which are considered significant within the Vedanta traditions. These Mahavakyas have traditionally been regarded as expression of the fundamental teachings of the Upanishads. Presented here are four major statements uh, as introduced by Lama Krishna, uh, the commentator and translator of the text Panchadashi, a uh, manual of Advaita Vedanta written around the 14th century. These are uh, Pratyanam Brahma, from Aitareya Upanishad, Aham Brahmasmi from Brihadaranyaka, Tattvamasi from Chandogya, I am Atma Brahma from, Man from Mandukya Upanishad. According to the commentary, uh, those, these four Maha Mahavakyas are extracted from four, four Vedas, namely Aitareya of Rig Veda, Brihadaranyaka of Yajur Veda, Chandogya from Sama Veda, and Mandukya from Atalva Veda. In other words, they interpret that these four Mahabhakyas not only conveys the essence of, Upa, the, of the four Upanishads, but also represent the essence of four Vedas. Here, I would like to focus on these two verses, uh, one from Chandogya Upanishad, and, uh, which states you are that, and the other from Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, uh, which declares I am Brahma. The Maha Mahavakya mentions here uh, depict two aspects. The Jnana part, where the teacher, in this case the, the father, Uttalaka, uh, teaches to the son, in part the teaching saying, you are that. And the yoga part, where one assimilates that acquired knowledge as their own experience, Aham Brahma Asmi. In other words, knowledge, Jnana, involves understanding and internalizing what has been learned from scripture and teachers as their own realization. A similar format regarding knowledge is uh, presented in ancient texts such as the Chandogya Upanishad as a contemporary practice known as Upasana. The phrase omite etat akshanam udgitam pasita instructs want to meditate upon the sacred sound on as equivalent to the chanting of the Udgita, a uh, high pitch chant of the Udgatri. Here the verb Upasita is used. It is the optative form, the verb root Upas, which carries the meaning of to worship, to direct attention, or to consider A as B. In this context, it directs one to contemplate and consider the high-pitched chant performed by the Udgatri priest during Vedic rituals as a sacred sound of Om. In more technical terms, it signifies the cognitive equivalence of the known object A with the supreme entity B. 
directing attention towards it. The form of vipassana involves focusing on what has been acquired from teaching and teachers, regarding it as individual to the supreme existence, Brahman. This allies, aligns with the methodology outlined in Jnana Yoga. In other words, it serves as an example that the roots of Jnana Yoga, as expounded in the Gita, can be traced back to the ancient Upanishadic text. So to conclude my uh, talk today, I would like to quote a passage from the, another passage from the Brihat Aranyaka Upanishad. Atma vare are trashtapya, shrotapyo, mantapyo, nididiyastapyo, maitreyi. Here the passage outlines a path where one should see and hear and repeatedly contemplate the truth and focus their attention on it. This signifies the process of acquiring jnana and internalizing it. Ultimately, liberation, uh, moksha, awaits at the end of this journey. This conveys an important message that emphasizes the repetition of acquiring knowledge and internalizing it. In other words, it can be understood as a form of discipline. As many of you are probably aware, Swami Vivekananda delivered a famous speech at the World's Parliament of Religion held in Chicago, USA in 1893. In his speech, he quoted the following verse from the Gita. Ye yata maam prapadyante tam satai papa jamiaham maam baltman baltante manshaha palta sarvashaha. Whosoever comes to me through whatsoever form, I reach him. All men are struggling through paths which in the end lead to me. This verse effectively conveys the message of the Gita that regardless of the path one follows, all individuals can attain moksha. Revelation. It became a well-known verse that introduced the teaching of the Gita to the Western world. It is worth mentioning that in the context of the world at that time, Western countries aims to demonstrate a spirit of tolerance towards representative of various religions from around the world. However, it was Swami Vivekananda who came from India and quote ancient Indian scripture that astound the Western audience by expounding on the potential of universal religion and spirit of compassion. His speech created a tremendous sensation, capturing the attention of the, and the surprise of people in the West. What we have explored today uh, jnana yoga is one, of the, uh, one, 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 one means towards liberation. Another path, of course, uh, is prepared, like uh, karma or bhakti. Uh, regardless of this chosen path, it is important for us to engage in these practices every day, uh, directing our attention towards knowledge, actions, and faith which means uh, practicing yoga. Yoga has gained attention recently, but not in the sense of uh, physical exercise uh, alone. Rather, it emphasizes an act of concentrating on a single point and directly our mind attentively. So today we have examined the concept of jnana yoga, uh, taking into account the relevant scripture and literature. In the Vedantic tradition, uh, it is not merely regarded as just a knowledge, but rather as a comprehensive process of engaging with a traditional wisdom from the Veda, understanding it, and personally realizing it. So this is a way how we, the scholar of Indian philosophy, are studying every day. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kato, for your thought-provoking speech. Kato At this time, we would like to request our second speaker of today's program, Professor Kathy Matsui, to speak on Swamiji's concept of
karma yoga. Professor Kathy Matsui is a professor of the Department of Global Citizenship Studies, Seisen University, Tokyo, Japan, and teaches courses on conflict resolution and peace-related subjects. She is a member of Swami Vivekananda Bharat Anniversary Celebration Committee. She works with peace researchers and educators internationally and is also active in inter-religious dialogues as a member of the Women's Executive Committee. Uh, Executive Committee World Conference of Religions for Peace, member of Reconciliation and Education Task Force in Japan. 続きまして、聖戦女子大学地球市民学科、松井ケティ教授に、スワミー・ビベーカーナンダのカルマヨーガの概念についてお話しいただきます。松井先生は、包括的平和学習、協調的コミュニケーション法をご専門としていらっしゃいます。また、主な社会活動として、本祝賀会を運営するスワミー・ビベーカーナンダ生誕記念祝賀委員会の委員を務めておられるほか、平和教育地球キャンペーンや、武力紛争予防のためのグローバルパートナーシップの活動にも取り組まれています。また、世界宗教者平和会議、日本委員会女性部会委員、和解の教育タスクフォース運営委員、平和教育、平和研究所所員も務めていらっしゃいます。では、松井先生、お願いいたします。Swami Vivekananda, Swami Mira Sananda, His Excellency Mr. Sivi George, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored and grateful to be given this opportunity to discuss the valuable Karma Yoga. Through the lecture of Swami Vivekananda, given in December of 1895 in New York, through I was greatly impressed as I read the transcription and found many of his words resonated with the thoughts I have as a peace educator. Swami Vivekananda's lecture on the concept of karma yoga is very encouraging to peace educators in the world. And I hope to share this learning experience with the people I work with and my students whom I hope to work with in the future for peace building. For I was encouraged that my actions, work, and mission are shaping my character toward the goal I am committed to attain. There is so much depth and wisdom in Karma Yoga that I struggled to find how I can organize this presentation and keep it within 15 minutes. After much thought, I decided to cite some parts of Swami Vivekananda's lecture. And respond to his wisdom with the work I do. I want to share with you what I have learned from Swami Vivekananda and connect that learning to the story of my journey as a peace educator, my vision for my continued work as a peace builder, and my hope for the future. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Kathy Ramos Matsui. The name Ramos is part of my heritage, a Filipino American, born and raised in Yokohama, Japan. I'm especially sensitive to war and peace. Because of my father's profession as a seaman, a US Navy civilian, his job was to transport ammunition and necessities to the war zone. He went to Korean War and Vietnam War. I heard many gruesome war stories from my father. I also visited US military hospitals as part of my Catholic high school tradition to sing Christmas carols to the wounded US soldiers who fought for their country in Vietnam. I still recall the sight of these soldiers, all taped up from head to toe, and the smell of pus and blood, even in a sanitary hospital. So that was my indirect experience of war. I'm a Catholic, and I was also brought up in a Buddhist environment. My maternal Japanese grandmother and my mother were members of a Buddhist lay association called Risho Kosekai. This organization was one of the founders of Religions for Peace, that is committed to leading effective multi religious responses to the world's pressing issues 
This organization believes that ambitious goals and complex problems can best be tackled when different faith communities work together. And this belief is also practiced by the Vedanta Society. I had a wonderful spiritual experience with the late Dr. Tsuyoshi Nara, the very person who invited me to join the Swami Vivekananda Birth Anniversary Celebration Committee about two decades ago. And now I would like to discuss this topic on the meaning, theory, and practice of karma yoga. Let me begin with a quote from chapter one. Quote, the word karma is derived from the Sanskrit Kri to do. All action is karma. Technically, this word also means the effects of actions. Karma as meaning work. The goal of mankind is knowledge. Now this knowledge, again, is inherent in man. No knowledge comes from outside. It is all inside. Be what he discovers or unveils what a man learns is really what he discovers by taking the cover off his own soul, which is a mine of infinite knowledge. In many cases, it is not discovered, but remains covered. And when the covering is being slowly taken off, we say, we are learning. Advance of knowledge is made by the advance of this process of uncovering." Unquote. I feel this is so true, as the word education means to retrieve the knowledge within each individual. Swami Vivekananda further mentions, quote, all work is simply to bring out the power of the mind, which is already there, to wake up the soul, unquote. This is a learning moment for the learner and a teachable moment for the educator. These words also remind me of an aha moment, an eye-opening experience I had at my first peace education conference, International Institute on Peace Education. I'll call it IIPE from here on. Held at the University of Hawaii about 30 years ago. This was the first time I met my mentor, Dr. Betty Reardon, the mother of peace education and founder of IIPE. All the activities I participated touched my heart, and I thought immediately, can't we have it in Japan? This learning process is mentioned in chapter five. Quote, the external teacher offers only the suggestion which rouses the internal teacher to work to understand things, then things will be made clearer to us by our own power of perception and thought. And we shall realize them in our own souls, and that realization will grow into the intense power of will. First it is feeling, then it becomes willing, and out of that willing comes the tremendous force for work, that will go through every vein and nerve and muscle until the whole mass of your body is changed into an instrument of the unselfish yoga of work and the desired result of perfect self-abnegation and utter unselfishness is duly attained." Unquote. This process of learning resonates with the valuing process of peace education. Knowledge, in other words, touching the mind, is our cognitive skill. We can seek knowledge through history, through what has been practiced in the past. Skills leading to feel means touching the heart. Our affective skill, we can learn alternative solutions by using our skills to imagine, think, create, and practice. We need to feel with our five senses what is happening around us, our community, our country, and the world. We are all a part of it. We need to open our ears and hear the moaning cries, feel the pain, and face the same direction toward our mutual future. Skills to take action are also needed. With knowledge, we can think, and with empathy, we can feel then we are compelled to take action. Action to change the world to a better place, 
a world filled with love and respect for each other. We have the right to live. Above all, we have the right to peace. So three years later in 1996, I organized with my peace educator friends, IIP in Tokyo at the International Christian University. Since then, my mind and heart were filled with how I can adopt peace education activities and curriculum at Seisen University, a women's university where I presently work as an educator. Then in 1998, since the 18-year-old population was declining in Japan, Seisen thought about how the university can sustain their educational mission and conducted a survey through Mitsubishi Research Institute of the majors that 18-year-olds would be interested in. The research results focused on areas of intercultural understanding and communications. Karma Yoga also mentions the importance of intercultural understanding in chapter four. Quote, it is necessary in the study of Karma Yoga to know what duty is. Do not injure any being. Not injuring any being is virtue. Injuring any being is sin. Therefore, the one point we ought to remember is that we should always try to see the duty of others through their own eyes and never judge the customs of other people by our own standard, unquote. This is indeed a theory of intercultural understanding that is much needed in peacemaking. In preparing for our new department, the president of Seisen University at that time appointed me and several other professors to form a committee and come up with a proposal of a curriculum for the new department. I suggested a peace education program, an interdisciplinary program to develop active citizens. I thought of the importance of inquiry, reflection, knowledge, skills to feel, and skills to take action for change. These actions, one after another, resonates with the following citation from chapter seven. Quote, in addition to meaning work, we have stated that psychologically, the word karma also implies causation. Any work, any action, any thought that produces an effect is called a karma. Thus, the law of karma means the law of causation, of inevitable cause and sequence. There may be millions and of kinds of happiness and beings and laws and progress and causation, all acting outside the little universe that we know. And after all, the whole of this comprises but one section of our infinite nature, unquote. Many causations of the past serve as dots that connected many other dots that occurred after my open eye-opening experience at IIPE. Steve Jobs, founder of Apple Computers, also mentioned the dots in his quote about leadership. Quote, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, your destiny, life, karma, whatever. This approach has never let me down and has made all the difference in my life, unquote. Just as I was inspired years ago at IIPE, I discovered that becoming a peace educator is my mission, my teleology. I have come to this world to be a peace educator. Then I promised myself that my mission is to go out and involve people. So that was the beginning of a new department launched in 2001 called Global Citizenship Studies. The curriculum consists of three pillars, interdisciplinary knowledge, communicative and conflict transformation skills, and field work, mainly experiential learning within Japan and to different parts of the world. Besides teaching at the university, I got involved in many other peace building activities, such as Religions for Peace, Global Partnership for Prevention of Armed Conflict, Global Campaign for Peace Education, and of course, the peace activities of Swami Vivekananda's birth anniversary celebration events. In chapter six, Swami Vivekananda quotes, when I am doing a good action, my mind is in another state of vibration and all minds similarly strong have the possibility of being affected by my mind. And this power of mind upon mind is more or less according as the force of the tension is greater or less. Every thought projected from every brain 
goes on pulsating, as it were, until it meets a fit object that will receive it. Any mind which is open to receive some of these impulses will take them immediately." Unquote. The vibrations that I send out reach other minds, and those people are like-minded people, or I would prefer to say kindred spirits, who work with me in solidarity for a better world. Swami further states, quote, according to Karma Yoga, the action one has done cannot be destroyed until it has borne its fruit. No power in nature can stop it from yielding its results, unquote. This quote is very encouraging for peace educators. When we educate and work for peace, especially for the eventual abolition of the war system, and toward a more just society, some ask, why do you take on such a pointless project that is incapable of producing any useful results? Are, you, are your feet on the ground? Do you really think this dream will ever be achieved? With Swami's encouragement in response, we can only say, because it is the right thing to do. The peace journey is not an easy one, but the answer to the many challenges is not hopelessness nor cynicism, but the conviction that peace is possible. If only we would join our minds and hearts, our spirits and will toward action. So therefore, I also find that it is my mission to propose peace education curriculum that is more than visiting Hiroshima and Nagasaki to the Ministry of Education in Japan because this very action is supported and confirmed by the theory and practice of karma yoga as mentioned by Swami Vivekananda. I am presently working with Asia Pacific Center of Education for International Understanding, also known as APSIU, UNESCO of South Korea, on a project to disseminate a common peace education curriculum in Northeast Asia. This common curriculum aims to provide peace educators with the common goals, meanings, contents, methods, and learning outcomes of peace education, pertinent and responsive to the needs and context of Northeast Asia while being faithful to UNESCO's vision. In conclusion, I quote from chapter seven the following, quote, what is karma yoga? The knowledge of the secret of work. We see that the whole universe is working. For what? For salvation, for liberty, from the atom to the highest being, working for the one end, liberty for the mind, for the body, for the spirit. We learn from karma yoga, the secret of work, the method of work, the organizing power of work, you learn by it how best to utilize all the workings of this world. Karma Yoga shows the process, the secret, and the method of doing it to the best advantage." Unquote. My upbringing, my religious background, and this experience of finding my mission as peace educator are dots that were connected. The dots of knowledge, effects of action, work, unattachment, unselfishness, and path toward freedom that is yet to be achieved have been connected to where I am now and my journey will still continue on. Thanks be to Swami Vivekananda. Thank you, Professor Matsui, for your illuminating speech. Our next speaker for today's program is Sister Jokei Sato, nun of Zensuji School of Shingon Buddhism. Jokei Sato was born in 1985. She, uh, she was ordained in Kagawa Prefecture in 2013 and trained at Zensuji Temple, the birthplace of Kobo Daishi, the main temple of the Shingon sect. She continues to work at Zensuji and meets various pilgrims every day. She has also deep interest in Vedanta 
and Ramakrishna Vivekananda literature. May we, re may we request you, sister, to deliver your speech on Swami Vivekananda's concept of Bhakti Yoga. 次にお話しいただきますのは、新豪州全通寺派の僧侶、佐藤上慶氏です。1985年生まれの上慶氏は、2013年に香川県で出家され、弘法大師のご誕生の地、総本山全通寺で修行されました。現在も全通寺に勤められ、さまざまな巡礼者に出会う毎日を送られています。また、ビベ,ベーダンタやラーマクリシュナ、ビベカーナンダの書籍にも、ご興味をお持ちです。上慶氏にはスワミー・ヴィベーカーナンダのバクティーヨーガの概念についてお話しいただきます。ではお願いいたします。ファーストオブオール、アイオファー、ショートプレイヤー。はじめに仏教の言葉で、体と言葉と心を清めるための三下と祈りを捧げます。我、昔より作るところの、もろもろな悪語な、皆虫の豚人地による、真語意より生ずるところなり、一切我今、三下した手まつる。弟子無効人未来祭、不摂生、不中途、不邪因。不毛語、不記語、不悪、不良絶、不見論、不信に、不邪見。音望、自死、たぼら、はだやみ、音さんまやさとば。みなさま、こんにちは。えー、佐藤上慶と申します。私は昨日、四国の香川県から飛行機に乗って東京に参りました。この台風と雨の中、今日皆さんとスワミ・ビベカーナンダの生誕記念祝賀会に集まれることができたこと、神の恩寵に感謝いたします。香川県のですね、私のいるお寺は四国八十八箇所霊場の七十五番の札所。善通寺というお寺です。善通寺は真言宗ですのでマントラーですねすごくあの体と言葉と心の教え共通性シンパシーを感じます弘法大師空海様の生まれたお寺ですその空海様の修行された道のりをたどって日々多くの巡礼者お遍路の方が訪れています巡礼文化が根付いている風土の中で神様や仏様を礼拝する多くの人々と交流してきましたお釈迦様や空海様のことを一心に慕うお遍路さんの姿とバクティとは普通の礼拝に始まり神への強烈な思考の愛に終わるとスファミ・ヴィベーカーナンダが説かれる信仰の愛の道バクティヨーガの教えは多くの共通点に満ちています今日は少し仏教的な立場からのお話になるかもしれませんが、私自身、常に勇気づけられているスワーミ・ヴィベーカーナンダのお言葉を引用させていただきながら、今、私たちが実践していくべきスワーミ・ヴィベーカーナンダのバクティヨーガの概念についてお話しさせていただきます。バクティヨーガ、それは自分の低い次元の快楽や感覚の楽しみを捨てるエゴイズムの放棄の道でもあります。しかし、窮屈さを感じることはなく、喜んで自分へのあらゆる執着を捨てることができる道です。なぜそれができるのでしょうか。スファミ・ヴィベーカーナンダが、えー、例えたお話に習って具体的に想像してみましょう。えー、I've been to a picture. Please look at this picture. 絵を描いてきました。私たちの人生の様々な喜び、自分のための欲望、楽しみを考えるとき、それはスターですね、星のようにきらめいて魅力的に見えます。ですが、そこに神を求める大きな気持ちが満ちて、大きな満月となって光り出しました。私たちが神のその清らかさ、大きな無限の愛を知り、常に神に心を向けて夢中になればなるほど、それまでの自分、エゴイズムに夢中になっていた、
、えー、自分の欲望は薄まっていきますそして、えー、清らかな心が感覚に怪我されず太陽のような大きな神そのものと一体となり眩しく光り輝くとその中に星も月も全ては溶け込んでいきます強い光の前で弱い光は次々にかすかになっていきついには全部が消えてしまうように自己愛着の思いは神への愛喜びの光の中でその影は弱くなり大きな信頼と安心に没入して満たされて私服を得るのです。スワミビベーカーなんだは偉大な目標に到達するための最もたやすく自然な道のりがバクティヨーガだとおっしゃっていますそこで、えー、ゴータマシュタールだお釈迦様の説かれた慈悲の瞑想という心を清める方法もバクティヨーガに通じるところがあるのでご紹介いたしますお釈迦様が自分の息子であるラフラに伝えた大切な教えです慈悲の瞑想は生きとし生けるすべてのものに慈愛の心を向ける瞑想でポジティブな祈りの力によって自分の心のネガティブの思いが消えていく瞑想です。慈悲・喜・者という4つの思いを深めていく方法で行われます。お釈迦様はラーフラにこう話しかけられました。慈しみ、マイトリー・ラビング・カインデンです。ラフラ慈しみの瞑想を深めなさいというのも相手の幸せを望む慈しみの心を育てることでどんな自分勝手な怒りの心も消えてしまうからです哀れみカルナーカンパッションラフラ哀れみの瞑想を深めなさいというのも苦しみを取り除いてあげたいと思う甘えみの心を大きく育てることでどんな自分の残虐な心、意地悪な心も消えてしまうからです。喜び、ムディター、エパスティック、ラフラ、喜びの瞑想を深めなさい。というのも、人を妬まず、その幸せを一緒に喜ぶことで、どんな不満も消えてしまうからです。4番目、シャ、偏らない、こだわりを捨てる、ウペクシャ、イクアメニティ。ラフラ、捨てる瞑想を深めなさいというのも、自分勝手な好き嫌い、判断や思い込みを捨てることで、どんな怒りも消えてしまい、やがて平等で穏やかな心を売るからです。え、工房大師空海様の言葉にも、嫉妬の心は私とあなたと区別することから生じる。もし私とあなたという区別をなくしたなら、真理が見えてくる。という言葉がありますこのようにただただ全ての人の中に神を見て幸せを祈ることで自分と他人といった対立行動はなくなり清らかな心の妨げとなっていた怒りや迷いの心が自然と消えていきます繰り返し繰り返し慈悲の瞑想をすることで慣れていき慈悲の心を身につけやがては神や仏と同じ清らかな心そのものになっていくことが心から神仏を礼拝しているバクティヨーガの実践者の姿ではないでしょうかまた次にバクティヨーガの特に重要なポイントとして死と弟子の資質について着目したいと思いますまず弟子の資質弟子となるものの条件ですがスワミー・ビベーカーなんだは教えを受ける者に必要な条件は、清らかさ、知識への渇望、および忍耐であるとし、また、不純な魂は決して真に宗教的であることはできません。思いと言葉と行為の清らかさ、宗教的であるためには、誰にでも絶対に必要です。とおっしゃっています。思いと言葉と行為。すなわち体と言葉と心を清める大切さはもちろん仏教でも重要な教えです私たちの日常は身体活動言語活動精神活動でできていますので修行は毎日の生活の中での絶え間ない実践です自分の嫌な面未熟なところに根気よく取り組んで変化して成長していくことを誓い一瞬だけのやる気ではなく一日や二日ではなく、続けていかなくてはなりません。そのための健康な土台となる教え、えー、先生が必要です。ですから、
覚悟を持ってこの人についていくという、この人を信頼して全てを委ね、未熟な自分と向き合っていく厳しい修行も諦めないという覚悟をずっと持っていられるだけの先生を見つけなければなりません。では、先生となる人の大切な資質、それは単なる知識の賢さではありません。ただ、その聖典に書かれている精神を理解し、有していること、義務や愛への熱望をその先生から感じられることが重要です。そして、清らかな人であるかどうか、正しい動機、すなわちすべての生き物への純粋な愛に基づいた、揺るぎない不動の心を持っているかどうか、といったことが大切です。魂は別の魂から衝撃を受けることができる。死は自分の中の善なるものへの衝動を引き出してくれる存在です。自分でも気づいていない、自分でも信じることができないほどの神の性質を持つ、内なる本当の自分。善そのものの性質を目覚めさせてくれる感動は、書物からは得られない推進力となります。私たちがより良い人間になりたいと望み、世界を信頼して歩み始めるときには、素晴らしい先生の存在が不可欠です。私自身の話をさせてください。私もこの現代的な日本に生まれ、えー、ちっちゃい頃から物質的な価値観、心を持って育ってきました。僧侶になるための修行をするとき、まだ冷静についての多くのことを知らず、懐疑的なところもあったと思います。しかし、一人の厳しい僧侶の先生と出会いました。その先生は本当に厳しく、毎日たくさん叱られ、大変怖かったのですが、揺るぐことなく、徹底して真面目な先生でした。その真剣さから、決して私たち修行する人を憎んで怒っているのではない、嫌ってはいないということは確かに伝わりました。その先生の妥協のない、献身に満ちた一途な信仰の生き方の中に、先生が信じている仏の姿を見て、私も信じるようになりました。それが修行の最大の贈り物であり、一生の宝物でした。先生の厳しさ、それは、えー、修行僧を仏の世界に近づけるため、また神仏の心を修行僧に伝えるための必死の慈愛でした。生みの親にも教えることができないことをその魂から感じさせてくれた先生に心を開いて信じるようになって多くのことを学べるようになりましたこのようにすっかり信頼して自分のすべてを差し出せるような先生との出会いがバクティの始まりになります明け渡す、帰依するとはどういうことでしょうか心から尊敬、敬愛するとはここで皆様に西洋へのチベット仏教の普及に大きく貢献したチュガム・トゥルンパ・リンポチェというアジャリの言葉をお伝えいたします。あなたの正体を暴露すること、それが明け渡すことである。自分の動作がぎこちないとしても、握手するときに両手が汚れていたとしても、それを恥じてはいけない。ただ、あるがままのあなたを差し出すこと。明け渡すこととは、ただ、あるがままの自分を表明していくことである。また、先生と非常に率直で個人的なつながりを持たなければならない。心から敬愛する精神のともに、2000万ドル捧げようとも十分ではない。捧げるべきは、あなたのエゴ。生命の流動体である自分の果樹をこそ捧げるべきなのだと。死の影響力は絶大です。冷静の道を歩み始めたいと思った時には、深く信頼し、自分の大切なもの、価値観やエゴイズムもすべて明け渡せる死を見つけてください。ブッダでもイエス様でも構いません。そして今、同じ時代を生きるさまざまな人々の中から、えー、自分があって確かめて、魂の共鳴する先生を見つけた時には、幼子のような信頼と素朴さを持って彼に仕え、思い切り心を開いて彼の影響を受け、国彼の中に神の現れをご覧なさいというシュワミ・ビベーカーナンダの言葉のように、死にはすべてを委ねて、自分は弟子の資質をしっかりと備える覚悟で、素直に一心についていきましょう。
。さらにスワミ・ブベーカーランダは、バクティ・ヨーガの方法と実践について、自分を形成する元となる影響のあるものを識別して自分の感覚を制御し清らかになっていく方法を説いています。食べ物の浄化についてシャンカラのウパニシャットの注釈書によると心のえここでの食べ物アーハーラとは実際の飲食物についてはもちろんのことですが集めて取り入れられるもののこと自分を形成する感覚や感情すべてのことです。音などのような感覚作用の知識が受けるものの楽しみのために集め取り入れられる。感覚器官の知覚の中に集まる知識を浄化することが、つまり食物を浄化するということです。このアーハーラの浄化という言葉には、執着や嫌悪や妄想などという欠点に汚されていない。感覚の知識の獲得を意味し、そのような感覚の知識が浄化されれば、内なる器官のサットは、調和、安定、英知の性質が純粋になり、絶えず神に心を向けて思い続けることができるということです。故に、自分の体や言葉やえ心を作る諸々の器官を抑制すること、それを清らかな、えー、意志の導きのもとに置くことが、内面の清らかさと純粋さを作りバクティの全建築を築いていく土台となります本日は心を清らかにしてバクティヨーガの道を促進していく方法として良き死を見つけること自分は良き弟子になることそしてエゴイズムをちっぽけにしてしまうぐらいポジティブに大きく心外の心を広げていくこと自分を構成する食べ物の識別、感覚の識別に注意を払い、怪我されないで自分の中に集まる意識を浄化することについて述べてきました。バクティヨーガの道のりについては、まだ多くの語り尽くせない深淵な部分がありますが、今日はやはり清らかな心の土台となる基本の部分が大切だと思い、お話しさせていただきました。シュアミビベーカーナンダはバクティの一つの大きな利点は、目指す偉大な目標に到達するための最もたやすく自然な道であるとともに、大きな弱点は、程度の低いものはしばしば、恐ろしい狂心に堕落することであるとおっしゃっています。ですが、さまざまな現実に傷つきやすい未熟な段階の私たちでも、恐ろしい狂心、盲信に堕落しないための方法は、すでに教えられております。情熱を持って死の教えを素直に吸収し、自分の心を清めること、それを忍耐を持って自分の心、感覚を制御していくこと。バクタが大きな侵害の心を持って自分自身の内なる慈愛の心を増幅させたなら、私たちの心は魂の輝きが星から月へ、月から太陽へと、やがては大きな神の愛に包まれていくことでしょう。何も恐れることはありません。すべての人、この世界のすべてが神の現れです。その太陽のような神の光、大きな愛、祈り、無執着の心に礼拝しましょう。形だけではなく、内面の清らかさを持って、今ここで私たちは一つになり、バクティヨーガを実践しましょう。今日お話しいただいた知識の道ギャーナヨーガと行為の道カルマヨーガそしてバクティヨーガ侵害の道と最後にお話しいただくラジャヨーガ瞑想の道この4つのヨーガを結びつけパラマートマン真が終えて本当の自由な心で羽ばたいていきましょう。Thank you very much パラマートマンリベカウンダありがとうございました。Thank you, Sister Sato, for such an inspiring and thoughtful speech. Our last speaker for today's program is Mr. Leonardo Alvarez to speak on Swami Vivekananda's concept of Raja Yoga. Mr. Leonardo Alvarez was born in Venezuela. In 1987, he obtained his undergraduate degree 
in psychology at Metropolitan University. He obtained his master's degree in clinical psychology from Sofia University, Tokyo. Currently, he is a PhD candidate at Sofia University doing research on the relationship between mindfulness, triguna, and psychological well-being. So, let's see. 本日最後のスピーチとしてレオナルド・アルバレス様にスワミ・ビベーカーナンダのラージャ・ヨーガの概念についてお話しいただきますアルバレス様は1987年に南米ベネズエラで生まれベネズエラのメトロポリタナ大学心理学部を卒業されましたその後来日され上智大学大学院臨床心理学コースにて修士号を取得されました現在は上智大学大学院心理学専攻博士後期課程にてマインドフルネス酸性質トリグナとウェルビーイングの関係についてをテーマに研究に取り組まれていますではアルバレス様よろしくお願いいたしますよろしくお願いいたします、はいうん、Hello everybody こんにちは皆さんいらっしゃいませ<笑> um, Thank you very much for the wonderful speeches on Gyana Yoga And karma yoga and bhakti yoga. I hope I can make justice and deliver something up to the same level. Now, today、uh, our topic of Raja Yoga is about meditation, and I would like to do a very brief meditation with all of you, just 30 seconds. So, we have three images we can focus in. We can focus on、uh, a lotus flower on our chest, or a candle light, or the infinite blue sky. ハスの花かろうそくか無限の青空を胸の中に想像して30秒か瞑想していきたいと思います。Alright, so you can relax, take a deep breath, then breathe out, close your eyes, and let us begin the meditation. Only think of the object of meditation. Don't think of anything else. We'll begin. <laughs> okay, kindly open your eyes slowly. And were you able to just think of the object of meditation for 30 seconds, or did you have any other thoughts crossing your mind? Did anybody was able to do it perfectly? Very good, sir. Very good. So keep on with the good work. For the rest of us good, who could not do it perfectly,、uh, let us see、uh, why this happens. Uh, this is uh, for, uh, because of samskaras, and to understand the impact of samskaras or accumulated habits in our minds, the study of Raja Yoga, as explained by Swami Vivekananda, would be of immense help. Swamiji not only based his clear explanations of the Patanjali Yoga Sutras on Vedic and Upanishadic knowledge, but also on his vast knowledge on. Sorry about that. About this. Okay. His vast knowledge on Western science. Until his publication of Raja Yoga, the study of meditation in the West has been thought and considered as a sort of mystical, mystery mongering practice, as a way to obtain occult powers by most people. But Swami Ji does away with all of this by explaining before us the whole process of meditation in a very systematic and scientific way. After his publishing of Raja Yoga in 1896, its impact spread wide across intellectual and influential circles and impacted the minds of people like Leo Tolstoy. Now, I will try to explain with my limited understanding on the subject, 
what Swamiji taught on Raja Yoga and how it can help us to concentrate our minds on a single subject, which is very important for us to work well and have success both in outer life and inner life. Now, according to Samkhya psychology, we humans have a chitta or mind stuff. It is composed of buddhi, the intellect, which discriminates between good or evil, right and wrong. Then we have manas, the mind, which is able to perceive the stimuli from the outer world. Then we have smriti or memory, which links all these experiences. And we have the ahamkara or the sense of ego. This forms our basic mind stuff. In this chitta, our samskaras are stored. And it means our acquired mental tendencies. Because of our samskaras, we cannot concentrate properly. <laughs> There's a saying, um, sow a thought and you will reap an action. Sow an action and you will reap a habit. Sow a habit and you will reap a character and sow a character and you will reap a destiny. This is a quote by Emerson. So samskaras are shaping our destiny. Now, samskaras are the product of our thoughts. Our thoughts, again, are manufactured by our minds. And our minds are mostly made of rajas and tamas, the qualities of restlessness and dullness, according to Samkhya psychology. Yet, Swamiji says that our mind is essentially sattvic, pure and stable, only that the coverings of rajas and tamas make it go downwards and make it restless. Now, this whole universe that we are seeing is the interplay of sattva, rajas, and tamas. The energies of activity, inactivity, and equilibrium. You have atoms that have protons, electrons, and neutrons. That is, positive, negative, and neutral charges. And their combinations create the whole universe. As a result, we can also see positive, negative, and neutral events, things, living creatures, human beings, and even our minds are always fluctuating between these three states. Now, neuroscience has also shown that when we are idle, our brain enters into the default mode network. It's a network that is made of habitual neural connections of many things that we have thought for many years, and the mind reverts to that. But the content of the uh, thoughts that we have in that state are mostly negative and anxious thoughts. And also research has interestingly shown that most of us are 50% of the time absent-minded. We're thinking of other things while we're doing our task at hand. But people report being most unhappy when they're absent-minded. There's a saying, an uh, idle hands are the devil's workshop, but we may also say an idle brain is the devil's workshop. That is why we are, at, we are advised by the scriptures and holy men and women to be always active and prayerful. That is to keep our minds as active and sattvic as possible. When we are, in contrast, actively engaged in constructive tasks, the default mode network shuts down and people report feeling most happy. This means that the brain has only two modes of operation. Concentration, which leads to happiness, or rumination, which leads to misery. So bear this in mind. Uh, either we're concentrating on something, or our minds will go to some idle thinking. Now, Raja Yoga can help us concentrate, overcoming the effects of our samskaras, rumination and restlessness to reach a state of permanent peace and bliss. The authority of Raja Yoga Patanjali in his Yoga Sutra says, Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodaha. Yoga is the quelling, Nirodaha, of the waves, Vritti, in the mind, Chitta. Out of this Chitta, or mind stuff, which we talked about before, whirlpools, or Vrittis, that, that is mental waves, or thoughts arise. The aim of yoga is to stop these waves. According to the nature of the waves, our minds can be tamasic, rajasic, sattvic, or a combination of these. Uh, Vyasadeva, in his commentary 
on the Patanjali Yoga Sutra says that we have five basic states of minds. Uh, most of us has, have only the first three. Uh, first is kshipta, which means scattering. A rajasic mind that is restless and fluctuating. We have mura, darkening, which is a tamasic mind, slothful, violent, hating. Then we have vikshipta, that has rajas and sattva. The mind tries to center itself on the subject and concentrate on God or the truth. But that concentration doesn't last long. When we can increase that concentration, we reach ekagra, or one-pointedness of mind, which is a mostly sattvic state, and the mind can focus on God or the ultimate reality. If we prolong this, we reach the state of niruddha, or arrestment. There won't be any waves in the mind, and we will merge with God or the supreme reality. Now, we want to reach that state of niruddha, but we have to do it gradually, from tamas to rajas, rajas to sattva, and then beyond the state of trigunatita. Now, Patanjali has laid forth an octopole path of yoga to achieve this. And I'll begin introducing our yama and niyama. For yama, or practices of restraint, we have five. The first one is non-violence, ahimsa. Means not killing other creatures, but also not being violent in words or deeds or thoughts, and rather praying for the well-being of people. Second, we have satya, truthfulness. It means keeping our promises, being congruent in word, speech, and deed. Also, we should live in a way that we don't have to lie about our lifestyles. And we should also not magnify ourselves when we speak. We should not exaggerate things. Non-stealing, asteya, means non-stealing of property, time, money, or ideas. Then continence, brahmacharya, means not following our sexual impulses indiscriminately. And Celibacy is very important for spiritual life. It will give us stamina and help us control our emotions and achieve mental balance. It also means that for males, we should look all women as their mothers, sisters, or daughters. And for women, they should see all men as their fathers, sisters, or uh, brothers, or sons. Sorry about that. But ultimately, it implies that we should give up the sex idea altogether and perceive that we are the Atman. Then we have non-receiving or aparigraha, means not receiving gifts from others. This helps us be free from the desires and conditions people put into the gifts and create self-reliance and self-confidence in us. Next, we have niyamas or the practices that should be encouraged. We have internal and external cleanliness. For internal cleanliness, antar sauchan, in addition to the above, Swamiji recommends four practices. First, we should be friendly towards all creatures. Second, we should be glad with the joy of other people. Third, we should be sympathetic to the sufferings of other people. And the last one is we should be indifferent to people who are evil to us. If we can keep these four practices, our minds will be stable and therefore pure. Then external cleanliness means keeping the body, clothes, house clean. These two practices together help to give rise to sattva, the quality of purity and stability. It makes the mind relieved, concentrated, and cheerful. Next, we have santosha, contentment. We have to distinguish between needs and greeds and live only according to our needs. It doesn't mean we don't have to be ambitious. We have but let us aspire for higher living and higher ideals rather than just amassing more wealth. Then we have tapasya, austerities. It means not pampering the body and mind, eating moderately nutritious food, also trying to wake up before sunrise. This is a major aspect of most religions, but quite hard to achieve sometimes. And uh, Research has shown that people who sleep less than five hours or more than nine hours tend to be at higher risk of death. So if you're worrying that you're only sleeping five or six hours, don't worry, you'll be fine. Uh, rather, don't sleep more than eight or nine hours because you'll die a little bit earlier than everybody else. So five to six hours is the time we aim for. Then we can practice silence now and then. 
not just with our mouths shut, but also with our thoughts, not talking too much in our minds, fasting, punishing ourselves for lapses, and avoiding intoxicants such as drugs and alcohol and all that. Swamiji also said that strength is life and weakness is death, and that we want nerves of steel and muscles of iron. So for Swamiji, physical prostrations and doing uh, workouts with dumbbells is another way of tapasya because it will kill the negative thoughts. Exercise serves to discipline the body and mind and to increase willpower, which in turn will protect us against impulses, especially when they are strong. So next time, if you're feeling tempted, go out for a running or do some weightlifting. It will help you. I can tell you from personal practice. <laughs> then we have study of the scriptures and contemplation, so dhyaya. So we have to study scriptures that help us reach enlightenment, like Swamiji's works, the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, the Bible, the teachings of Buddha, the Quran, and so forth. Also repeating Om and thinking of its meaning. But we need to imbibe the meaning of the scriptures. For that, we need to concentrate deeply. Um, there's an example of Swami Turiyananda, a brother disciple of Swami Vivekananda, who would take a single verse of the Bhagavad Gita and meditate on that single verse for one whole week. That was his practice. So we can follow suit as well. Then meditation and worship of God, Isvara Pranidana. Meditating on God, doing all works for Him, um, praying to Him, worshiping Him, and seeing Him on other people and inside of us as well. Now when we're practicing, some negative thoughts may come to our minds and you want to fight them off. For that, we can do Pratipaksha Bhavana, or thinking of the opposite thoughts. There's a nice prayer by St. Francis. It says, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Also, repeating the mantra of our chosen deity can help because it will help to concentrate the mind on pure thoughts. And you can do it anywhere at any time. And also, we can think of strength when we're feeling weak. Swamiji said, Why weepest thou, my friend? All the powers of the universe are within you. After we have finished all these practices, we can go to asana or posture. Posture means any uh, position you can Keep the body with the back straight for a long time without feeling uncomfortable. So you can either sit on, the, on a chair or, or on the floor. Hatha yoga can help you with that a little bit. Then comes pranayama, the control of prana. Prana is the energy aspect of the universe and akasha is the matter aspect. Einstein showed that when matter is accelerated, it becomes energy. So this whole universe is the interplay of prana and akasha, energy and matter. Now, with pranayama, we can control the grosser forms of prana, which means the movement of our lungs. Then we can move to subtler movements of our nerves, and finally, the subtlest in our minds. Swamiji said, the chitta has by its own nature all knowledge. It is made of sattva particles, but by practicing pranayama, uh, it has been covered by rajas and tamas particles, but by practicing pranayama, we can take off that covering. Now, the safest way to practice pranayama is by breathing rhythmically without kumbhaka or holding the breath for long. Uh, you can imagine you're breathing in purity and exhaling impurity. Of course, you need to learn this from a co competent guru. And brahmacharya is also important when you're practicing pranayama because you're changing your whole nervous system, body and brain. They say that the Sushumna, the channel inside of the spine, will open and Kundalini will rise. So you need a very sturdy nervous system and brain and lots of energy and resilience to withstand those changes in body and mind. Next we have Pratyahara. Prati means restraint or withdrawal of what? Ahara. It also came before. Ahara means not only food, 
But according to Shankaracharya, any stimulus that is perceived by the mind and digested by the mind. So we don't have to be only careful about food, but also about the things we are exposed to that affects our minds. Because whatever the mind is attached, it will take the form of that object. If you're thinking of the book, it will take the form of the book. If you're thinking of the smartphone, it will become the smartphone. If you're thinking of negative news, it will become that. So Swamiji has likened our minds to that of a naturally restless monkey who has not only become drunk with the wine of desire, but has been also stung by the scorpion of jealousy and even possessed by the demon of pride. To make things worse, somebody in our modern age gave that monkey a smartphone. So you can see how restless that monkey will be. And that monkey, who is in a pitiable condition, is not other than our own minds. So we have to be very careful about our emotions and the things we are exposed to with our gadgets. Because we are mostly being fed negative news or stimuli, and most of the time it's just trash for the mind. But by practicing pratihara, withdrawing the senses from the outside world, we can control the mind better. If we're successful in pratyahara next, we can actually begin meditating. So you see, you need all these steps to actually begin practicing meditation properly. Of course, you can do all this simultaneously as well. Now, when dharana becomes more, uh, that dharana is a state where you can concentrate on an object, in this case, God or the ultimate truth, for some time. But there's restlessness in the mind, and the mind will wander away. Uh, when you can intensify that, you'll get dhyana, what is known in Japanese as Zen, uh, the state of meditation proper. It's like the state of oil flow, flowing from one vase to another continuously. In psychology, there's a very similar state called flow. It, it is a very high level of concentration on the task at hand, a task that is challenging, but our abilities match that difficulty. In this state, people lose consciousness of body and time and gain remarkable insights or produce outstanding work. Geniuses like Einstein, Mozart, Beethoven, and even Olympic athletes are said to experience this state frequently. To cultivate this state is excellent, but we need to shift the focus from the outside world to the truth and God when we are practicing Raja Yoga. If we can hold that state of flow for long, we will experience Samadhi. And it is said that when we experience the highest level of Samadhi, Nirvikalpa, Nirvija, or Asampratnyata Samadhi, all of our samskaras, conditionings, and the seeds of desire and ignorance will be destroyed forever. That is what is keep keeping our minds wandering all the time. When that is eradicated, the mind becomes stable and reflects the innate purity, innate essence of Satchit Ananda, pure consciousness, existence, and bliss. Now, you may ask, how can we know that we're making even a little bit of progress with these practices? You'll begin noticing that your minds are becoming calmer, steadier, and that you have more control over your body and senses. You will be more at peace with yourself and the world. You will be more independent, self-reliant, and self-confident. You will be more humble and at the same time stronger. You will be less affected by the joys and sorrows of life. You will be more cheerful and resilient. You shall doubt less and be more certain of the things you say and do. We will grumble less, and this is something I have to work in a lot, but our knowledge of things and ourselves will also increase. We will also be able to see through the appearances of things and see into the real nature of things. We will be more focused or work, performance will increase, but at the same time, we will be able to take better rest. We will also be able to withdraw our minds to a safe haven within whenever we want, and we'll be, have more feelings of compassion and universal love for all things. Our useless activities will be less, and we will use our time more efficiently and effectively. And we'll feel that our, our lives have meaning and will grow physically, mentally, and spiritually. 
We shall not just be carried away by the rapid waters of life, but shall steer ahead against the current, following the beacon light of our high ideals, aboard the powerful boat of our concentrated minds that will take us to the source of the river of life, the spring of pure consciousness. Here we shall see glimpses of our true nature, our birthright, knowledge, existence, bliss, absolute, that we are children of imperishable bliss and do not depend on anything external. Our grief will bid farewell to us and we shall start becoming what we were to be all along. Next, to let us finish with a short recap to make the contents uh, sink in. First of all, we cannot concentrate well due to our samskaras. These arise due to desire and ignorance, and they have become unconscious, automatic, and we instead have now become their slaves. Through the practice of yama and niyama, we get the power of discrimination, self-regulation, and renunciation to overcome their effects and destroy their seeds. After being established in our postures, asanas, and withdrawn our minds from the senses, pratihara, our minds will have the power to concentrate, that is, dharana and dhyana, and finally merge into their own nature, samadhi, into satchidananda where we shall find true happiness and freedom, which are the true goal of life. So let me finish with Swamiji's quote, let us arise and awake and stop not till the goal is reached. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Leonardo. You made a very uh, Difficult subject, very interesting. Your speech was really interesting. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have so far listened on concepts of four different yogas from four speakers. On behalf of the celebration committee, I would like to once again thank all the speakers for their outstanding deliberations. I now request Swami Medhasananda Ji to offer his comments on synthesis of all these four yogas. Sate, Minasama, Kokoma de de, Yome no Katakara, Yotsuno Yoga Nitsi to Hanashi Tadakimashita. Sbarasi speech of Stikuda Sata, Gorahi no Minasamani, Hon Shukuga in Kayo da Hioste, Imaichido Oreo Moshangimas, Do Maria to Gozaimasta. Suzukimashite, Suami Meda Sananda Gini, Kono Yotsuno Yoga no, Yoga no, Tongo Nitsi, O Hanasho Itadakimas. では、お願いいたします。では、ミセスコニカゴルワル、ディレクターアブデアビベカナンドカルチャーセンターアンドフレンズ。<coughs> My hearty congratulations to all the distinguished speakers of this session. They skillfully presented Swami Vivekananda's concepts of the various yogas, along with their own observations within the specified time, which was, however, not an easy task. I would now like to say a few words on today's topic. Yoga is both the goal and method of a divine or in other words, ideal life. Each yoga practiced according to one's aptitude and ability leads to the same goal. One of the famous utterances of Swami Vivekananda is as follows, quote, each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest this divinity within by controlling nature, external and internal, 
do this either by work or worship or philosophy by one or more or all of this and be free this is the whole of religion doctrines or dogmas or rituals or books or temples or forms are but secondary details unquote during his second visit to the west in 1899 swami ji spoke specifically about the synthesis of yogas which was his unique contribution to the ideas and practices of yoga he said quote would to god that all men were so constituted that in their minds all this elements of philosophy mysticism emotion and work were equally present in full that is the ideal of a perfect man the synthesis of all the four yogas was also vivekananda's ideal of religion he also devised a visual representation of this synthesis of yogas through a logo which was later made the emblem of the ramakrishna modern mission and is now widely known to the common people the story of swami ji's conception of this logo is interesting and it is narrated below on a july morning of 1900 during his second visit to the usa swami ji was sitting at the breakfast table at the newly founded vedanta society of new york at that time a printer named hendy van again appeared he said he was making a circular for the vedanta society and wished to have an emblem to go with it he requested swami ji to suggest something swami ji took the envelope of a letter he had just received tore it open and on the clean inner surface drew some waves a swan a lotus and the sun encircled by a serpent he passed on the paper with the design on it across the table and said draw it to scale hendry the printer was also an able draftsman and so he converted the rough sketch into a finished drawing apparently swami ji's drawing of the emblem representing the synthesis of prominent yogas was casual and yet the idea was actually working in his mind for a very long time the urgency of creating the circular just prompted him to materialize it vivekananda himself explained the logo in the following words the wavy waters you see the wavy waters in the picture are symbolic of karma because wave is always moving nami ga isu ogoite mas the lotus you see the lotus of the bhakti and the rising sun of gyana the encircling serpent is indicative of yoga and the awakened kundalini shakti while the swan in the picture signifies paramatman the supreme self hence the picture indicates that by the union of karma bhakti jnana and yoga 
the vision of Paramatman, the Supreme Self, is obtained. The logo has an inscription that reads, Tanno Hangsaha Prachodayat. The Supreme Self awaken, may the Paramatman, the Supreme Self, symbolized by the swan, awaken our higher understanding. Let me remind you, the Swamiji's concept of an ideal man is a person who can synthesize all the four yogas in his life. Swamiji planned the daily schedule of our ashramas, that is centers of the Ramakrishna order, founded by him in such a way that all these four yogas are practiced by their monastic inmates, so that they can harmoniously develop themselves and become ideal monks. Hence, in the day-to-day -day life of our ashramas, we practice Raja Yoga through meditation. Bhakti Yoga through prayer and rituals, Jnana Yoga through the study of scriptures and cultivation of discrimination, and finally Karma Yoga by trying to perform work as instruments of the Lord and by working in a selfless manner. These things help to make our spiritual practice easy and interesting and finally lead us along the way of perfection. Let me conclude with the hope that householders take a cue from the above discussion on a perfect life and how the synthesis of yogas would help in attaining it and practice it accordingly. Hence, my friends, you may do a little meditation, Raja Yoga, and prayer, Bhakti Yoga, and study scriptures like the Bhagavad Gita, Jnana Yoga, for a little while every day, say, for about only 30 minutes in 24 hours. My dear friends, is it impossible to set apart just 30 minutes in your 24 hour schedule, what do you say? Is it possible or impossible? Do this Kamina san, Sanjupun dake ga mei so to benkyo no tame ni skau koto dekimasu o muri desu ka? Muri? Do desu ka kotaete kudasai? Muri or muri de anai? Just and also work with an attitude of giving more and taking less. Very, very important. Give more, take less. Practice of giving more and taking less attitude is the first step of selfless work. Practice these things for two weeks and you yourselves will realize their benefits. In course of time, such practices will convert your home into an ashrama, which is said in Sanskrit, griham tapovanam. In this way, a life of stress, fear, disharmony, and lack of peace will be transformed into a life of abiding serenity and joy. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you, Swamiji, for your synthesis. With this, we are about to close the first part of the program. 
However, before the last part of the program, I would like to make a few important announcements. 皆様、本日のプログラムも折り返し地点の前半終了に近づいてまいりました。ここで前半終了の前に皆様にいくつか大切なご案内をさせていただきます。There will be a 30 minute intermission following the closing of the first part of the program. We request you to kindly go to the main fire for a light refreshment. Volunteer ushers will guide you. You are requested to kindly have the refreshments only outside this auditorium. Kindly note the auditorium rules do not permit the consumption of food or drink in the auditorium. You are requested to kindly use the garbage bins for any trash. When you leave the auditorium, kindly do not leave anything behind. We deeply appreciate and thank you for your kind cooperation. There is an exhibition in the main foyer of series of devotional songs and books on Hinduism, meditation, Ramakrishna, Vivekananda in both Japanese and English. If you wish to place an order, our staff in the foyer are happy to help. Everyone is requested to kindly fill up the questionnaire and submit at the 前半終了後30分間の休憩となりますロビーでお菓子と飲み物をお配りしますのでスタッフの案内に従ってロビーにご移動くださいなおホー,ル内ホール内では飲食ができませんので申し訳ございませんがロビーなのでお召し上がり,上がりくださいまたゴミは必ずゴミ箱に入れ施設内をきれいに保つことができますようご協力をお願いいたしますまたホールを出る際には必ずお荷物をすべてお持ちください。後半の部ではお席をすべて入れ替えますので、休憩時間中にお席にお荷物を置いておくことはできません。申し訳ございませんが、ご理解、ご協力をどうぞよろしくお願いいたします。ロビーでは書籍や CD などの展示を行っております。ヒンドゥー教や瞑想、ラーマ・クリシュナ、リベーカーナンダなど,のなどに関する日本語と英語の本、参加の CD などを展示しておりますのでぜひご覧くださいまた購入を希望される方には注文方法をご案内いたしますのでロビーにおります私どものスタッフにお声がけくださいまたアンケートにご記入の上受付にお渡しいただけますと、えー、大変ありがたいですどうぞご協力よろしくお願いいたします Now I shall request Mrs. Konika Agarwal Director of Vivekananda Culture Center in Embassy of India to deliver Her vote of thanks. では前半のプログラムの最後にインド大使館を代表しましてディベーカーナンダ文化センター所長カニカ・アガルワル様から皆様へのお礼の言葉をいただきます。Very good evening to one and all present here. My respect to Swami m e d a s a n a n d a ji, distinguished Speakers and all ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a matter of great pride for the Vivekananda Cultural Center, Embassy of India, Tokyo, to celebrate Swami Vivekananda's achievement and honor his ideals and philosophies. I will not repeat, but I mentioned before also, and I, I, I'm sure many of you were present during the Vivekananda Jayanti celebration on January 12th. That for some reason, Swami Vivekananda and his teachings are very close to my heart. So every time I hear of any event commemorating him happening anywhere, I, feel, I naturally feel very interested in it. As we all know,、uh, the distinguished speakers have taken us through the life of Swamiji and his four basic teachings of Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, and Raja Yoga. So, these four works of Swamiji actually form the basis of the Indian philosophy as well. So, if we are able to understand them and if we are able to imbibe them in our life, We are in a way very close to India, and I am so happy to see that so many of our Japanese friends are present here. I would rather first like to congratulate them and thank them for their devotion to Swamiji's principles and the fact that they are able to imbibe the Indian philosophies in their life. 
So Swamiji was one of the greatest visionaries of modern India who left an indelible influence not only on the Indian society but also made an irresistible appeal to many people who came in contact with him both in India and abroad. On behalf of the Embassy of India Tokyo, I take this opportunity to thank each one of you for participating in this program and making it more meaningful. I extend our gratitude to the Vedanta Society of Japan for collaborating with the Embassy of India Tokyo for organizing this event. I would also like to thank the distinguished speakers for sparing their time to create awareness about the ideals and philosophies of Swami Vivekananda among the friends of India and Japan. Last but not the least, as I already mentioned, I would like to congratulate all of you for being able to understand Swamiji's philosophy because as I was sitting through the lectures, I could feel that it is actually very difficult to absorb what was being taught because to understand these things, you have to relate them to your own self, how you can practice it in your daily life. Because every time I sit with Bhagavad Gita, I sit with the resolve that I want to relate each and every word to how I can practice in my life. So probably that is the reason I have not been able to thoroughly complete the Gita till now because whenever I want to read something, I want to read it with an intention of actually imbibing it. So I am very happy to see that so many of you sat through the lectures and I am sure many of you also understood what was being said and I hope many more of you will be able to practice those teachings and ideals of Swami Vivekananda to keep him alive in our hearts forever, in the hearts of all Japanese people as well. Thank you so much. Part two of today's event, the cultural program, will begin immediately after the intermission. Kindly return to your seats by 4.40. The cultural program will begin with devotional songs followed by Indian folk dances. Kohan